Pranakosha live stream. Hey folks, it's Matt of Pranakash Productions, and today we're talking with Brian White, creator of the incredible YouTube channel Future Raza. So, right off the bat, we have something in common, I don't know if you noticed, but you're Brian White, and I'm Matt Weiss, which in German is Matt Weiss, which mm -hmm. means Matt White. Yeah. So there we go. Yeah, we're like soul brothers. We didn't even know it. <laughs> yes, we're. It, it's more of a distant relation. We're not even acoustically related, but uh, thematically, perhaps. Yeah. Well, you might have some German in you just by looking at you. Uh, mostly Irish. Oh, Irish. Can you yeah. speak with an Irish accent? Oh, yes, but I won't. Uh, I actually took two of my boys to Ireland last summer, spent two weeks in Dublin. That was a whole lot oh. of fun. Cool. Very expensive. Huh. Yeah. Well, you know, it's so funny. My wife really wants to go to Ireland. That's one of our bucket list things we want to do. It's beautiful. Uh, al along with seeing the um, the Northern Lights. Now, I don't know if you can see them in Ireland or not, but I definitely want to see them somewhere, probably Alaska. But yeah. the other thing we have in common is you said you used to live in Auburn? I did. Auburn, Washington for Wait. some number of years. Right, which is just a hop, skip, and a jump from Seattle, which is where I say that I live, even though I don't actually live there. <laughs> I actually yes. live in Linwood, but nobody knows oh, okay. where Linwood is. I went so to I Meadowdale High School. Oh, you went to Meadowdale? Yeah. My youngest kid went to Meadowdale. I mean, Meadowdale is literally three blocks from my house. That's funny. Yeah, and I go yeah, walking I... over there all the time through that little woods. Yeah. Did you go to the yeah. middle school, too? I did. And I went to Seaview Elementary. Oh, yeah. I drive by that stuff all the time. Yeah. Interesting. Now, okay. So were you a troublemaker or were you a good kid? No, I was a good kid. I was, uh, there weren't a lot of kids in my neighborhood my age. So you had to do a lot of things to keep yourself entertained because there were three stations and the odds that the, any of them would be playing something that was of interest to your age group at any given time was very low. And so talking you had TV to stations or radio stations? Yeah, TV stations. Oh, no, there was plenty of radio, but just like today, it's all ads. So uh, was... Hold on. So there was CBS, NBC, and uh, ABC, but there was also the local, which I believe was Channel 11, right? You could sometimes get a little bit of 11, but we were down in Brown's Cove, uh, which is uh, right down there by the water. So we were facing north. So we could uh... actually... We had better luck picking up Canadian TV than we did uh, local stuff. So, folks, <clears throat> uh, we're, we're showing our age already because we're, you know, these days when you talk about cable TV, that's like old school. But we're talking about network TV, which was over the, magically over the airwaves. They somehow did it without cables. Isn't it weird? And that was old. Mm -hmm. Back when there was... Okay, between three and four stations. There was also Channel 9. Could you get that? That would be the fifth we, station. We couldn't really get nine. We could get four, five, seven, sometimes 11, eventually 13. Oh, yeah, 13. And then at one point, there was uh, the uh, UHF 22 loop antenna you could pick up at 7-Eleven. Oh, I can not uh, got that. Okay, so okay. these numbers mean nothing to anyone else. Okay, Channel right. 11 was like UPN, right? Eventually. Well, let's see. It was it was basically hey, the yeah. reruns channel, yeah, yeah. and then uh, and that's the channel that you would watch <clears throat> Star Trek on, right? The original series, and then channel oh, thirteen. Oh, are you into Star Trek? For I I had not known. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I even wear it as a badge on my chest here. Mm -hmm. But I also have Baby Yoda. It's hard to tell, but that's Baby Yoda. And this is a Tie Fighter. You can't tell. And then over here is Space Command, which is another indie show in production right now that has a bunch mm. of Star Trek actors in it. Mm. I happen to be a co-producer of it. Neat. And an investor. So, um, out of L.A. Okay, since I mentioned Space Command, uh, we're way off the track already, but this always happens. Space Command. Can you see that? That looks great. Doug oh, Jones cool. is one of the stars. And the great thing about this show is that you see him without a mask on. 
Hmm. I don't know if you know who Doug Jones is. I will look him up. He plays Saru in Star Trek Discovery. He also played the monster in, uh, oh, what was that movie called? The water movie. Oh, yeah, Shape of Water. Shape of the Water, really he was the monster. Guy. Yeah, you he do tends never to play get monster to see his parts. face. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you almost never do because he's usually playing <clears throat> some kind of monster or another because his background is as a mime. So he just has the most amazing body language and body gestures. So he gets those type of roles. Anyhow, uh, well, okay, back to Channel 11 was the reruns. Channel 13 was sort of an alternate rerun channel, I guess. Did you say? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it was early Fox before it was right, Fox. So, right. Yeah. Right. And then Channel 9 was PBS. So that's where you would watch Masterpiece Theater and uh, what other shows. You also could see like Faulty Towers. And I think you could get some uh, Monty Python on there too. Yeah. You would watch Monty Python on Channel 9. I didn't get Channel 9. So I'll take your word Oh, you're for deprived. It. I know. So I you, know. Ne you grew up without Monty Python? Yes, I didn't get to experience it until I was a teenager, probably oh. 15, which is, to be fair, a fine age to get broken in. But uh, yeah. True. <clears throat> True. Okay. So anyhow, so we're soul brothers on all kinds of different levels. Mm -hmm. um, but yet we found each other through... Our mutual soul brother, which is Elon Musk. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say Randy Kirk. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, Randy Kirk. <clears throat> Elon Musk via Randy Kirk. Mm -hmm. So, and then, of course, and then you're, you've made a name for yourself rather quickly as like the guy who's a bit of a Tesla guru. Well, I appreciate you saying that. It's been almost four years now, so oh, I don't know long. about... It has. It's been, uh, it'll be four years in October. Uh, and building a name has been really, really tough. I am really good with spreadsheets. I'm really good with numbers. Uh, I can work some magic that way. There are things that I don't know how to do that I don't know how to make sense of, and I'm the first to admit it. And okay. while I do production and deliveries often extremely well, okay. this quarter I did not have a deliveries estimate. And it was yeah. because... I couldn't see my crystal ball was too cloudy. So I didn't, but I did, I could see what production was doing and I got to within 0.36%, um, putting me once again, and it's probably four or five times out of the last 13 quarters, I have been the most accurate on production numbers because I study all the footage. I know what's going on and I know how to crunch the math. And uh, so you do, you have a special <clears throat> uh, patented, differential calculus equation you run it through i actually show every quarter i will i make a video showing how i got to my numbers so that yeah. if i have a uh a, a an assumption that you disagree with you can adjust in your own mind and say nope it's going to be a little more or a little less and uh i've been i've been within 91 cars before and it was a quarter Ooh. where i was the outlier where I was at the very edge of what the production estimate was. And everybody was saying, nope, it's going to be a big miss. Uh, production was way down in, in China. Now, back then, China didn't publish weekly sales figures for you to get a pretty darn good estimate. Right. So you had to figure out what you were doing. And, I, and so I went through months of drone footage looking at uh, to see how many of the condenser towers were in motion on any particular day during the flyover. Condenser then, towers, what's that? Oh, the heat exchangers that uh, release, you know, that have the fan blades in them on the okay. rooftops that, that move heat in and out of a building as needed. It's the big, you see them on top of buildings and they've got fans in them that spin when they're in use. And I counted how many of them were in motion. And then I compared it to the weather patterns of the previous two months and determined, no, the factory is actually going full speed ahead. You guys are all too low. And, uh, and I came in within 91 cars. And I thought, That's awfully ah, clever. I've made it. I'm going to get respect. And that was not the day that I got respect. So I get uh, no taken... respect <laughs> for any danger field. <laughs> yeah, yeah. God bless his soul. <clears throat> yeah, he had uh, a lot of, lot of good, good one-liners. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you ever think of doing a side project where you predict how many Starlink satellites will be around the Earth at any particular moment? So I've looked at the numbers, but the numbers are out there. You can just check and see how many there are because every object in space is tracked publicly. 
So okay. uh, yeah, that one that one's That's too easy. Too what easy. I did, the one that got me famous though was I when there was only about fifteen to twenty vertical columns at Giga Texas, I made a mathematical prediction of when the factory would be complete. And I mean complete. And I would track it every week. I would show you where we're at, where the progress is. And I came within two weeks of it. And in the early days, people were saying, a project this big, we don't even know necessarily what the full scope of it is. And yet, and everyone was just sure I was going to be way off in one direction or the other. And they were all, especially the hammer swingers, those guys got so mad because you've never worked in construction. How could you understand a project overview? And the answer is, it's an overview. That's all it is. And there was an equation and I showed how I did it. And uh, yeah, it came out to within within two weeks on a, a on a 15 month uh, prediction. Okay. So you are extremely scientifically rigorous, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but is there a, a metaphysical element to it? Like, do you also check the astrological positions of the planets and so on? No, but there is a bit you know, of know, Isaac Newton, everybody knows him as basically the father of modern physics, right? Right. He was still into all kinds of other wild stuff besides just that. that like alchemy be. and all those types of things. So How'd that, 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 that the the academia and the physicists kind of like to de-emphasize that part. <laughs> well, that's the beauty of science is you can be wrong about something and still be right about something. Oh, but else. so hold on there. So you just complete so you discount all the Well, all you said alchemy. Stuff. I discount I discount alchemy okay. out of hand. Yeah, alchemy, uh, we, I guess. Unless maybe we, we don't even know what it is anymore. Well, we know how to make gold in a super collider. It's just much too expensive. That's true. Yeah. It's easier just to dig it out of the ground. Mm, so much easier. So yeah. much easier. Um, okay. There is a, a an element of intuition that I will do where I'll say this number feels wrong. So I'm okay. going to bump it up or bump it down a little bit. Um, but again, I'm, I'm very transparent about that because uh, I just feel like that's the kind of, I try to make the kind of channel I want to watch. I try okay. to do the kind of analysis I would like to, you know, take in and, if somebody will only tell you bad things or only tell you good things, you don't know. You'll never know the truth. True. If you know. Okay. Yeah. So intuition. So is that just your subconscious, or is that coming from your the deep the depths of your eternal soul? I don't think we can know. Why not? Well, uh, all you have to I do is look inside and observe. Because I haven't seen any studies on it. Well, I who needs say, a study? All you have to do is close your eyes and watch the workings of your own mind. Have you ever been asked a question where you knew the answer, and then they asked you, how did you know that? And you had to tell them, I don't know. It's yeah. that, I think. The answer was there all along. Uh, and sometimes you have to trust the data that's being fed to you from, from the back burner. Okay. All right, you dodged the question. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Okay, so I think I first saw you, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the first time I saw you was you started to become sort of an advisor for, I believe it was Best in Tesla. Is that true? Yeah. That's, yep. He's in the Netherlands, right? He's in Denmark. Denmark, okay. You're was the that second your first person gig? this week who thought it was the Netherlands. So... Um, the first channel that I was featured on was uh, Electrified with Dylan Loomis. Okay. What had happened was when I created the channel, I said, see, I'd created a bunch of YouTube channels before. And the thing with YouTube is everyone's an overnight success because if they're not, they usually give up. The mm -hmm. vast majority of channels you see, if they don't hit what they believe is a, a level of success, they stop. Now, some don't need any, you know, for some, the number is five. And they'll just keep going. My son uh, streams video games. He has almost no viewers and he's happy as a clam. He right. loves it. But for me, it was, I have to monetize within 90 days. On day 87, 88, 89, Dylan Loomis saw one of my math predictions and said, wow, this is amazing. You have to check it out. And boom, I was monetized. Cool. They happened that fast. Yes. Yeah, but I mean, I'd already made 30 videos at that point. So... Mm -hmm. You're just um, waiting for the one to hit. Yeah. And then the first real partnership was um, uh, Best in Tesla had asked permission to use a video or two. And I reached out to him and said, I used to do these 
um, every, you know, every week trackers that were really long. Um, can I just do them for you instead? Make them really short because I don't have the time to do all that editing. And he said, absolutely. Uh, so I did it weekly for a while and then went to monthly for a while. Mm -hmm. And then it's, you know, just a whole, whole lot of work uh, for very little return. And so, yeah, I know Lars quite well. I was mm -hmm. uh, given an opportunity to speak at Fully Charged in San Diego about a year and a half ago. Oh, right. And when, and when they gave me the opportunity, they said, by the way, I don't suppose you could put together the entire panel, could you? I was like, oh my gosh. Uh, yes. They go, we understand you know Lars. Can you get him out? First, okay, so you just, uh, the first rule of acquisition in Hollywood or whatever is always say yes and then figure out how you're going to pull it off. <laughs> well, and, and that's that's what I did is I said, I can, well, and I can, I could absolutely pull a panel together. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and this was by email, so they couldn't hear the hesitation. Okay. And they said, you know Lars, could you get him to come and speak? And I said, yeah, I'll ask him. Is there a budget for it? Nope, no budget. He'll have to fly himself out from Denmark to San Diego on his own dime. And that's a couple so thousand I, bucks. And I was like, I'll ask him. And he said, yes. Wow. So I've gotten to meet him uh, a number of times now because we also met at Fully Charged in England. And uh, Okay, yeah, got a great, question for you. Great guy. Uh, he, he makes an effort to try to speak with an American accent. So okay. does he always speak like that or only on his show? On his show, he has the opportunity to practice and do multiple takes. When you interview him live, um, it takes a lot more time to compose your sentences, you know. So uh, I would say his accent is much thicker in real life than on the channel. Because it's funny, his version of American act, he's trying to sound kind of Southern. I, you know, it's a little comical for us to hear a European trying to sound like a kind of goofy Southerner, right? <laughs> it, so I was an exchange student to Germany, and there was a girl who had just come back from a year in Georgia, right. and she had an authentic Southern accent. Oh, cool. Yeah. It faded pretty quick, but... Yeah. Okay, so Lars, and then uh, have you ever been on... Uh, I'm going to run through the Tesla shows that I watch. Uh, you, you're on Brighter with Herbert, right? We've seen you yes. on there, right? Um. And then how about, uh, shoot, oh, God, who are the two, father and son? Oh, Zach and Jesse? Yeah, they're called Tesla Time News. I have Tesla not been Time on News. their show. Now, okay. Yeah, Tesla Time News on Now You Know. I got um, you then. I've not. Because I've, I've been I've on the show. Them. Yeah, I, I don't know, know I what it, it is. I've, yes. I uh, sent in one of those supercharger videos. Nice, <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, the, uh, yeah. I had my... So, I... 20 seconds I, uh, <laughs> I reach out to them a number of times about collaboration or cooperation, really? even reached out to their eco wear company about maybe making t-shirts and just never heard back. Um, That's interesting. But I did, yeah, it's unfortunate. Uh, I did get to meet them very briefly in, uh, at the after party for the, for the recent Cybertruck delivery event. Hmm. Um, yeah. And I was supposed to be joining them on the on stage, but uh, at the last minute, the um, event organizers vetoed that. So, huh? Oh, I suggest you keep trying because it seems like you'd be a perfect fit for them. Oh, I would, but I, uh, I have sent them an, uh, an email since then and uh, have not heard. So, huh. I will. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, because I'm sure they watch brighter with Herbert, and then you're also on. Uh, Farzad's one, right? What's his, his called again? I I have not been on his channel officially. I was on it today as part of a, a mega stream that that went out on maybe five channels. He's also never been on my channel except today he was because again we were doing a simulcast. Okay. So yeah, but I've met him two three times as well. That's cool. Yeah. Wow. So uh, well, let's let's back up a little farther then. So how did you? become interested in Tesla? So I've always been interested in electric cars. I've been following the news on it since probably 2012. Uh, I, I owned a 2008 Zen Electric. It's a little neighborhood electric car. Very goofy, very impractical, uh, but super fun and kind of a head turner for as cheap a car as it was because it's like nothing you've ever seen before, certainly in America. Okay. And they only made a few thousand of them. But uh, 
I started really following Tesla maybe, well, when Rob Maurer launched the Tesla Daily Podcast. I was always oh, yeah, listening him. to that. Yep. And then when, yeah. And then when the price went down, when there was the big dip in May of 2020, uh, of 2019, I put 75% of my retirement account into Tesla. All right. All in. Significantly kind of more than 75% because it's performed pretty well for me. You got like, well, and, for a while it was a 15 X. I think it's now to 10 X now from that. Yeah. That time. Yeah. I so, got in around a good return. My, my average cost was something like 13 in today's dollars, 13, 25 or something. So, yeah, so that's yeah. 11 or 12 X though. So yeah. I noticed today after hours, it went up 10%. So it hopefully did. that will hold. It did. I just wanted to go up for long enough to burn the short sellers out this week. <laughs> yeah. Because roast them. Roast them. <laughs> Stop short selling. I think it's uh, terrible. Uh, you know, short selling would be fine if they didn't also engage in practices to try and artificially distort the share price right. for their own very short term gain. So, whatever. yeah. The, we, I'm in the, it for the long haul. The short sellers, AKA the Fudsters. Yes, very <laughs> much so. So then uh, I was already doing things like predicting so when FUD factories would be fear uncertainty and doubt right that's right um so i was already doing things like trying to predict how long a factory would take to be built okay. built out counting the squares all that okay. and so when it came time to do the channel i was like well, i should probably just do this because i'm already doing it for myself why don't i do it for someone else oh cool. yeah Okay, so I'll, now I don't know. You probably have no data to, to give me a, a decent answer, but um, when is the India Gigafactory going to be done? I, two years ago, made a video saying Giga India is next, and I laid out the case for why. It sounds like you know a fair bit about um, India in general, if you're asking this question. Well, yeah, here I'm, we have Lord Shiva. Uh, there you go. It was like one of the main Hindu deities. This is the not, the cosmic dancer, otherwise known as Nataraj. So, they yeah. have they have the <laughs> they have hundreds of engineering colleges. Mm -hmm. They have tens of thousands of world class engineers. They have a mature automobile manufacturing industry. They have all the domestic resources needed to build a car. They have the copper, the iron, the phosphate. What else? The glass. And they also I mean, have an air pollution that. problem, so that could be solved rather handily. Yes. And they've got a grid stability problem that could, they be, drastically, do. That could be drastically smoothed out by having vehicles that only draw power when there is enough. And throw in a, a few thousand megapacks, too. That ought to smooth it out. The megapacks would do it. But if you've got millions of cars able to feed back to the grid as needed for a small premium, then all of a sudden, uh, the grid is stable for the first time ever. Oh. And it would be, it would be, it's, and it, well, yeah, but India, the average car is, you know, $11,000. Yeah, the Honda Amaze is $11,000. The Honda Amaze has a global end cap crash rating score of one star for adults and zero stars for children. That's not good because you want to have five stars, right? Five would be ideal. That would be the number okay. you're shooting for. So one for, for adults and zero for children mean this car. I get it. You'd rather have, I'd rather have an $11,000 car than a 25 or 30. Th but I bought a more expensive car because the safety of my family is the most important it's thing. Important. Yep. Yeah. Since we're talking about India, I mentioned Shiva. Uh, also, we also have here the Bhagavad Gita which is the most famous and well-known text in Hinduism. And then we even have Krishna with his flute and mm. a little miniature starship enterprise dangling off it just for effect. <laughs> so there we go. And I did spend a bit of time in India. So I, I, I experienced firsthand how I would say five times a day the power would go out where I was mm. up in Maharashtra. It would, it would go out and come back on within a few seconds. But I mean, then everybody was just used to it. So they definitely need yeah. some, some things to smooth that out. Mm. Yeah, that I was 20 been, years ago though, right? 
I had been trying to plan a trip to India before the lockdown happened and travel ended. Um, but there's just a whole lot of moving pieces to a trip like that because, you know, the it's not like a lot of destinations where you can fly visa free or even get a visa super easy. I mean, there's steps, there's obstacles. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, now, yeah, and with with my work, there's um, my my time isn't always as flexible, and I feel like consistent power would be the one thing that would make it possible for me to do my job uh, from the road. So, oh, so you have a real job besides being a YouTuber? No, no, being a YouTuber is my real job. Oh, but you have to feed the beast. You have to feed that's the true. beast, and that's why I've already made over three hundred videos this year. Um, so, so when did you uh, when did you uh, after you monetized when did you make enough money to be able to be a full time YouTuber? How so long did I that had take? I had sold a business some years back, and okay. uh, that provided monthly income for uh, five years, and it was just winding down um, as this was getting started. Hmm. Um, and I had an option to buy the company back and I shouldn't have, but I did anyway for a, a fraction of what I got, but they, um, yeah, it's been a disaster, but, uh, they, uh, why, why did I ask what the business was? It's a website, just a publishing business that, uh, that has been online since Oh two. So Oh one Oh two. Hmm. So it gets good page ranking for no reason other than longevity. Hmm. So it just, it just prints money but a very small amount what's and, the subject matter uh comedy it's a comedy channel oh it's a comedy website i spent a lot of the last 20 years desperately trying to be a comedy writer and by trying i mean that was my job i was a comedy interesting writer, but okay what i so i was a banker first okay i burnt out and then I spent the next 20 years as a comedy writer, which meant I was also a travel writer and a car writer, a freelance writer. And, uh, and then I would have to do an odd job here and there to, to fill in the, the income. Okay. For, for the most part, the real thing that I would just keep coming back to was comedy. So uh, have got, you ever tried stand-up yourself? Um, no. So there, as you know, apart from Seattle itself, over the last 20 years, there haven't been that many places for comedy. Okay. Um, and well, just like an open mic somewhere, just to try just the hell of it. Yeah. Well, you got to find it. And, but um, I was asked that question last year. I was in Michigan for their big event. And there's a, a gal there, Grandma Karen, who, who loves me. He, she thinks I'm the funniest person ever. I and think you'd be I, great. Uh, you have a really, oh, I mean, I you are just put out a lot of positive vibes. You'd be great as a comic. I'm a great storyteller, I think. So yeah. I, I, she, she said, uh, she goes, uh, do you have a routine? And I said, yes, but I've never done it. And so I gave her, you know, like a six, seven minute set and it went really, really well. And then uh, I had, uh, and then of course she made me do it for a second audience the next day. Oh, great. And, uh, it went well. So yeah, it was, just but it was too scary to keep trying over and over again or. No, it's just too time consuming and yeah. getting it. I, I have to, I don't make the kind of money that allows me to have hobbies that don't okay. produce money. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, hmm. But do you still write scripts just for fun when something come, pops in your head? Yes. But more, more than that, I write jokes that end up in my shows because I'll still, I am, Regarded by some as the funniest person in Tesla, which is not saying much because there are not very many people with any sense of humor. Well, Elon Musk uh, who... can do a, do a few every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I meant in the in the in the coverage of Tesla. Hmm. Um, I'm yes. There there are a few channels that think they know how to make a joke, but there are certain professions that lend themselves well, to humor. I got a secret weapon right here. It's a oh, deck of it's... dad jokes. Might as well break it open. <laughs> I'm ready. You know, I bet you didn't expect to be talking about Indian gods and goddesses and dad jokes on this show. Mm -hmm. There we mm -hmm. go. Um, I'm going to just shuffle here. And then we're going to go like that. And then I'm going to pick a card right here. 
It's a giant font, but I still can't read it. Okay. What's an ice cream's favorite TV show? Mm. What? Come on, man. All right, all right. Uh, Golden Girls. That's good. But uh, and you know what? That would be just as good as this. But the, the card says Game of Cones. That's not bad. That's <laughs> not bad. I'll allow that. All right. One more. All right. Okay. Here we go. Uh, you know what? You should sell these on your merch store. <laughs> or you can make your own dad jokes. You could probably make just as good dad jokes as these. You just need 52 of them for a deck. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is E.T. short for? Mm. Extended the name. He's only got little legs. Ah, yes. Okay. Ah. That is true. That is okay, true. Okay, one more. Three's a charm. And then yes, we'll get one. back to the meat and potatoes of the show. Right. Because we need to dive into the fact that uh, the, the Cybertruck has now gone to 48 volts and everything that that means. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you call it when a hammock teases another hammock? Mm. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I have nothing. Hammockery. Oof. Yeah, they had nothing either. <laughs> I, I feel like they wrote all the, the jokes without punchlines and then said, oh, no, we're out of time. Quick, just put something in there. Actually, you know what we could do? Mm. We could just go to X, otherwise known as Twitter, and we could pay our sixteen ninety nine a month, whatever it is, and then we could go to Grok and say, tell us 52 dad jokes so that we can yeah. put them in our deck. <laughs> and so I have up with ones just as good as these. I have access to Grok, and the other day I asked it for a series of knock-knock jokes, oh. and boy, were they catastrophically terrible. <laughs> they were, it has no capacity for humor yet, but I'll, I'll tell you, uh, my jokes are more like, I talk about things that are important on the show, things okay. like the bot demo, and like sometimes I'll get employees who will share insights with me, and one of the things that is apparently a problem with the bot is that um, it won't stop calling Elon daddy because, and I hate to point this out, it still has a few kinks to work out. Okay. Since you mentioned bots. Well, it was a kink joke, but all right. Oh, sorry. There you go. Okay. There you, go. you know this show, right? Star Wars. Yeah. I, he looks like that guy with the red arm. I don't recognize him. Oh, R2. Where are you? It seems we are made to suffer. It's our not, lot in life. You may not recognize me because of this red arm. <laughs> okay. So, 48 volts. <clears throat> this is a big one. Yeah. So, do you want me to just go into it? Yes, let's hear your entire treatise upon it. Yeah. <laughs> Cars have 12 volt batteries. That's not a secret. Everyone knows the battery that goes in your car is 12 volt. The light bulbs are 12 volt. The horn is 12. It's all 12 volt. Why? Why is it 12 volt? Well, because um, when cars signs first in the Zodiac, made, that's why. <laughs> it's, it's not a bad guess. When, car when cars first got electrical systems, all they needed to do was crank the motor and headlights. And then they added more things over time. So when they first started, they said, well, what's the cheapest, easiest, just get it done. And don't Six forget the cigarette system. lighter. No, that was much later. Yeah. That was much later. <laughs> so the six volt days, um, car makers, as soon as they started adding radios and blinkers and brake lights, they realized we need, we need to rethink this because six volt is the wrong voltage. The wiring is too thick. It's just, it's not good. So I said, okay, you know, it's a cost effective level to go to will go to 12 volt the wiring is now much thinner it's a more robust system it just works well that was in 1954 53 ish 55 that they switched to 12 volt the whole industry switched well by the 60s they realized 12 volts not the right we need to go higher we need to go 24 48 we need to go higher 
But, but every time someone would try, they'd find, well, all the suppliers are doing everything in 12. What do you want a supplier to stop making 12 for just you? And then they'd try a little consortium of them. We're all going to go to 48 volt or 24 volt. Nah, it's not, it just never happened. You go to 48 volt because you get much thinner wires, much thinner, and you can and you can get some other benefits too. But the real big one is you're saving all your component costs go down. So Tesla would have liked to have gone to 48 volt sooner, but the same problem, the suppliers wouldn't do it. So when it came to the Cybertruck, they said, look, we're going to be making half million, million plus of these a year. But here's the catch. I need 48 volt, period. And the car. Elon Musk manuf- style is just basically make it so I don't care. Just make it happen. Make it so. Yep. And so they uh, and the suppliers reluctantly agreed. These parts in the beginning cost slightly more. Soon they will cost the same. And eventually they'll cost pennies less than the rest. But we're saving a, a ton of copper. And 48 volt is critical because 48 volt is what you need to perform two specific tasks that have not been performed much on cars before. One is the steer by wire, because instead of having a hydraulic system that's capable of applying the kind of torque you need to turn, we need to do that with an electric motor. And it has to be 48 volt, otherwise Um, the motor would be too big. With one caveat, uh, it seems to me that the starter motor on gas powered cars seem to work fine on 12 volts, and that takes a lot of oomph. Yes, but rarely. That motor would need to, if that motor was constantly in use, it would burn out. Um, So you, uh, the other thing with the starter motor is look at how thick the wiring is that goes from the starter motor to the, I mean, that's a thick, thick wire. Okay. Now, if you were using a 12 volt motor to steer, it would be much larger. And the wiring connecting it to the high voltage system would be as thick as your thumb in order to work reliably. Because with steer by wire, now if your linkage controlled steering goes out on your car, if your hydraulic pump fails, you can still muscle the car to the curb. You can, it's not fun, but you can do it. But with an electric motor, what happens if it fails? So they've got two motors, a push and a pull, and they're both going every single time. And they're both applying variable pressure to test the other guy to make sure, wait, I'm not doing the whole thing, am I? And if one of them has a fault, that you get a notification to pull over immediately. Otherwise you could have a catastrophic failure. So both of those. So in order to get that steering system to work, they needed 48 volt. And then this. Yes. It seems to me like you have some kind of expertise or background, both in mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. Yet uh, your business was just some kind of website. Yeah, banking and comedy. So I don't have uh, much of a scientific background apart from enjoying it and studying it and interviewing people who are much smarter than me who cover things like this. And then once I've got enough of the pieces, I start putting them together and then I get a, a theory and I can run it by people and see if I'm crazy or not. And they can help me figure out if I am or if I'm on the right track and how to take the next step, which is this. The, the last piece of the missing puzzle that 48 volt makes possible is break by wire. If you could do, so Tesla had said, we're going to use this new revolutionary method of manufacturing called unboxed, where we build whole assemblies and just put them together on the line, kick them out the door. Right. And I, when I heard that, I went to an engineer, uh, a, a, re- a retired Ford engineer, and said, why hasn't... Was his name Sandy anyone- Monroe? No. <laughs> no, his name's Bert. Uh, and he made the um, cooling system for the Mach-E. That was one of the okay. last things he did before he retired. And I said, why hasn't anyone done this before? And he said, because it's not possible. It's impossible. You can't do it. So you picture, well, like when a car is built in the old fashioned way, all the pieces are stamped and welded together. You run the hydraulics, you run the wire, you put all the outside stuff on. And he said, "You." so I said, right. But if they're doing these whole big assemblies and just putting them together, he goes, right, but you still have the wiring that run- needs to run the length of the car and the hydraulics. And I said, well, the wiring, we just heard 48 volt. That means they've got little like, it's basically like an internet connection that connects them. 
So you just clip, clip, clip. Ethernet, it. So right? Ethernet, it doesn't need to run the length of the car anymore. It can just be connected in a way that never fails. Plus, and he said, aren't right, they, still need- didn't I, may, I might have dreamed this up, but aren't they just running the current, isn't there an idea of running the current just through the, the body of the car itself? Oh, I haven't heard that one. I think, I don't know how that would work. I don't okay, think that's, okay. he said, but you still couldn't do it because you need hydraulic lines for the steering and the brakes. I said, well, the steering is steer by wire and the braking, is that going to be brake by wire? So I looked into it. Brembo already makes a brake by wire system uh, that just hasn't been used in cars because if you put it on your Honda minivan, there's no fail safe. What is your fail safe? Downshift in an electric car, your fail safe is the electric motors. Yeah. So the 48 volt makes the steering possible, the braking possible. And the electric motors make well, all the fail safe. Hydraulic braking is not. I I had a I had a Datsun B twelve hundred that half the time you press the brakes and your foot would go to the floor and you'd have to pump it three times before it finally worked. <laughs> so I mean, it's not like hydraulic brakes are all that reliable either. That was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. I haven't had uh, failures like that are pretty rare, and. On an electric car, they're rarer still because there's so much diagnostics that go on inside the system before you and I would ever notice the problem. It's not like in a gas car where you will, without notice, blow a radiator hose, which I've done probably five times in my life. Just normal driving in a car that was well-maintained. Or throw a rod. Blew. I haven't done that. <laughs> I haven't done that one. But, uh, but my friends Jake and Elwood did. Okay, I got a story. Sorry. All right. It's always happening. That's all right. That's what we're here this for. This is the story that put me over the top and convinced me, you know what? It's time to bite the bullet and buy that Model 3 that I've been dreaming about. Okay. Because I had a 95 Honda Civic DX sedan four-door that I loved. And I never, I had 350,000 miles on it, manual transmission. And I just wanted to drive it forever. So one day it finally went <clears throat> and then died on a hill. Luckily, it was right at the top, so I was able to push it off to the side, and it was at nighttime. And then, like an angel from heaven, five minutes later, this guy driving a white model Tesla Model 3 drove up and, oh no, I, no, I couldn't push it off the road. I, I was stuck in the road, and he stopped and helped me push it off the road. That's what happened. So this white Model 3 sent from God himself and he, then when he then when he whooshed away, I was like, you know what? This is a sign. It's time for me to buy my Model Three. So I got my car towed to my driveway. Now you're gonna love this. And then I went and I ordered the Model Three, and I'm like, I'm getting it. Okay. Then the next day, I was out. Uh, I had to wait a few months for it to show up. And the next day, I, I I popped the hood of my Honda just to see if I could tinker with it. And you know what the problem was? There, there were two screws that hold the distributor on, right? Yep. One of the screws had completely come off and was sitting there right on the, on the manifold. And the other screw was half unscrewed. And there was like a quarter inch gap between the top of the distributor and the, the thing that goes into the cam. And it was just sitting there waving in the wind. And I was like, this has probably been like this for like a month. And somehow the car was able to drive until finally it got loose enough. So all I did was put the screw back in, screw it back in, and the car ran like a champ again. But I was like, you know, whatever. I, I'm already getting my Model 3. And you know what I'll do? I'll still keep my beloved Honda and I'll drive it sometimes, you know, just for old time's sake. And I was like, cool with that. Okay, so then my Model 3 shows up. Um, I have a picture of it somewhere. Just a sec. Well, whatever. You have to watch one of my other interviews. Watch my Randy interview because I showed it to him. I have this really cool Model 3 that's half half silver and half black trim. It came with black trim, but I, I swapped out as much of the black trim as I could. And um, But I realized that the corner back panels are really, trim things are really hard to 
to switch out because they're glued in. So I was like, mm. okay, I'll keep some of the black. And it actually looks really cool. And then I gave it gold wheels. I've got this really cool gold spray, uh, what's it called, prismatic, whatever, mm. fancy paint, metal paint that a shop did. Anyway, so it's got gold wheels and half and half on the trim, and it looks really tripped out, tricked out. Anyhow, so I got my Model 3, and I swear I drove that car for two days, and I'm like, you know what? Screw this Honda. I'm never going to drive that car ever again. My Model 3 is like 10 times better. I just haul that thing away. I never want to see it again. <laughs> and that was the yeah. car that I was in love with for like 20 years that I thought I'd never be able to get rid of. But my mm. Model 3 just completely blew it out of the water. And I, and I was like, I don't need this pile of junk. <laughs> you know, my Honda 95 Honda Civic anymore. So oh, that's 95. That was a good vintage. <laughs> yeah, it was a great car. Oh, yeah. It had a sunroof and everything that leaked, of course. <laughs> and uh, it still got 30 miles to the gallon, even though it had over 300,000 miles on it. I sold a, an 84 Honda Accord hatchback. I sold it with 176,000 miles on it to a coworker. And years later, I talked to him. And of course, he was still driving it. Yeah. Yep. It smoked like crazy, but it ran fine. Yeah. Smoked like a chimney. Anyway, I mean, folks, if you've never driven a Tesla, go find a friend who will drive you around or go to one of the Tesla stores nearby and try it. Speaking of that, have you tried the new Model 3? I have. I've driven it around the block, so to speak. I went out to the Bellevue event uh, the, for the Tesla Owners Club of Washington. What? Do you still live in Washington? or so ago. Uh, yes, but I'm right by the... I'm an hour north of Portland. So I am... Technically, right on the border, uh, you can almost see Oregon from where I live. And, oh, so you're uh, like in Vancouver or something like that? I'm I'm in Longview. Longview, okay. So that's exit uh, like forty ish. Okay. So yeah, it's yeah. Well, the Bellevue Milton. Square has a Cybertruck too now. Yes, I went there for the Tesla Owners Club of Washington event for that as well. And uh, I've also seen it at for the with the Oregon Club, and then a second time with the Oregon Club where we could get in it. Yeah, and then, uh, in it. yeah, yeah. And they wouldn't then, even let uh, us touch it. They had a bunch of barriers around it, so you could just yeah. see it, but you couldn't touch it. Yeah. So yeah. I've I've been able to get in it a few times, and then last weekend at the uh, McAdams Service Center, the service manager who bought one brought his in and let us touch it. So, what did it feel like? cold metal. Mm. Uh, one of the many jobs I've had over the years was uh, working in metal fabrication. Uh, my job was sanding and deburring. So mm. I have some strong opinions about the finish of the vehicle, which is to say they've done it right. Getting the edge, when you've got a flat edge, when they stamp it, however they cut it, you're going to end up with a rough edge and you have to smooth it. And if you don't, you will scratch everyone and everything. You'll snag clothes. It'll, you don't want that. And stainless steel is very difficult to work with because unlike aluminum, where you can just sand it in one or two passes, uh, stainless, oh, it just really doesn't want to deform or scratch or scrape. So if you were sanding it to put a finish on it, instead of running it through two, three times, you might run it through 15 times. And every time it gets hotter and hotter and hotter until you have mm. to just you can run it through twice and then you have to let it sit for five, 10 minutes cooling down before you can work on it again. So, so how done did they good job fix those corners then? Um, so I, I don't know. I assume they just did it the same way where they would use basically a buffing wheel to okay. smooth it out. But because you saw, you probably saw that system. video where they gave it, they, who did they, it was Sandy Monroe, I think got a walk Camisa. through. Well, Oh Yeah. So Jason Camisa said he actually cut his arm. Now, he didn't show his arm to, to let us see if there was any cut. I imagine what he meant was he scratched his arm uh, because that's more believable. But they just, yeah, softened the edges. And I did not get to see that. I know there's this persistent uh, frustration in the Tesla community that how come all the influencers get to go to all these events? Clearly, Tesla's given them some special treatment. And I guarantee you sense. that's not what happens because... It, you would think that they would, but uh, they don't. We all get in on plus ones from people who got picked in the lottery. And I don't get those. I, my fan base is not as big as the competition. And they, 
Yeah, I've I've been to one thing once, and it was a shareholder meeting. So well, your trajectory. I, I think you're lines. about you're in the boost stage, so you're getting close to Miko, and then then you'll hit we, a new we level. Shall see. It does yeah, come yeah. in waves. It does come in waves. Getting uh, from like ten to fifteen was was quick. Ten to fifteen thousand, and then it stalled, and then it shot to twenty, and then it stalled, and then for, once I broke twenty thousand, I went straight to twenty five thousand. Stalled there for maybe three months, and from twenty five to fifty thousand was very quick. Months, mm. literally months, and then it's been like a thousand a month extra subscribers since then. But the stock has also been down. And when the stock is down, enthusiasm's down, viewerships are down, revenue is down. Yeah, we're so all when the next big run up happens, yeah, it'll I'm sure come around and I'm hopefully well positioned to take advantage of that. Right. Then you'll be able to do stage separation and fire the orbital insertion rockets. Mm-hmm. Then you'll be orbiting mm-hmm. at a what like where do you want to plateau at? Like Hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, million. Well, getting to a hundred thousand is the next real milestone. At a hundred thousand, you get a level of respect that you, you get. You get one of those platinum thingies, right? Yeah, silver yeah. play button. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm languishing at nineteen something, nineteen and some change. So nineteen is good. Yeah, it's, it's I, taking I know a while. That work very hard and put in. And, and make some really clever, really beautiful stuff. One of the editors for Now You Know, um, Brian Reby, Drives Electric is the name of the channel. He makes masterpieces of videos, but nobody knows. And he's got thousands of subscribers, but not tens of thousands. Yeah. And it's unfortunate, but that's just how YouTube is. Well, that's just how business is. You, you have to figure out a way to market and promote yourself. Of course, I guess Tesla broke that mold because they were like, we're going to make a great car that's going to sell itself. And they pretty much, of course, Elon Musk has been doing a lot of expert salesmanship over the years. And so, that approach works for some YouTubers too, but it doesn't work for everybody. So, yeah. And it works for one car company, but none of the other, all the other car companies still advertise as aggressively because they feel they have to. True. Okay, that's a great topic. So what do you think Tesla should do as an advertising strategy now that they've sort of dipped their toe into the, into the shallow end of the pool regarding that? So there's news out from last night. I don't know if you've had a chance to catch it yet. We now get to see what their advertising effort was. They hired an, an in-house advertising team to make videos, and they ran those very limited ads for a very short amount of time and then let them all go. Uh, the let team, who? the team go. Yeah. All of them. Mm. 100% of them. Now so, the team, okay. was this one of those things where Elon Musk came in and flew into a rage and fired them all in a, in, a, <laughs> you know, in a, I mean, it a looks like tantrum it. type of thing. It looks like it. But yeah. that's the thing with advertising is you don't expect day one results. It depends yeah. what it is you're doing. But for the most part, you expect it's it's getting the flywheel in motion. Mm. That's what you need to be doing. So Well, okay, I'm sorry to interrupt. Of, but now, you notice he did the same oh, thing. Oh, that's all right. With, remember back in the day when Starlink was just a pipe dream and nobody thought it would ever happen, really? And then the, yep. the main headquarters was in Seattle in Bellevue. And it was sort of floundering along until one day Elon Musk got pissed, flew out there, and fired every, all the managers. And then soon after that, they started putting satellites up like crazy. Remember that? Yeah. The, um, and now well, there's that, thousands so of them up the, there. Yeah, that's where the satellites are manufactured. Or yeah. were until now that they've created a new factory in Texas, in Bastrop, uh, yeah. which is Brand new, state of the art, beautiful, purpose built. Um, they like starting with a green field because you can build things the way that you want. If you're going to up. be producing something from the ground up, mm-hmm. if you can save 50 bucks a car by having a straight line instead of a gap here or a pole in the wrong place, 50 bucks doesn't sound like much, except that if you're making a million cars a year for 10 years, that's a half billion dollars. Pretty soon you're talking about real money. So with no. the 
Uh, no, you're wrong about that. That's not a half million. That's that's fifty million times ten, which is five hundred million. A half billion. Yeah, I thought I said a half billion. Oh, did you say half uh, billion? I, I thought I, said I did, half but million. we can check it in the edit. Okay. Um, no, it's yeah, a half billion. It's it's pretty soon. That's you're a lot of money. Talking real money. Uh huh. Um, so with the advertising department, if I said to you, hey. What is the what is a good size team to bring on to work on ads? What what number would you suggest? Well, here's what I suggest: do what you did with your cyber cybersecurity department, which is basically have a bunch of fans create the ads for you, and then just pick the best ads and run those. Do a competition and say the best ad will actually use. Yes, and pay for, and reward you in some way. Yeah, we'll maybe give you it's a, a, the newest VIP. model three or. Sure, you or, get a, or no, you just get a night a out with Elon experience. Musk. Yeah, you get to. Oh so no, you, even better, you get to play video games with Elon Musk and get your ass kicked. <laughs> that's better than where I thought you were going. I thought you were going to say, "Oh no, you get to have his next kid," because that's <laughs> a thing too. But they hired forty people to run this ad department. Four Forty. zero. Forty. Four zero. Hey. Forty. Right? Exactly. That's what I said. Is that's the yeah. wrong number? That's yeah. too many people. Yeah. Ten is what I would have suggested at most. You need scrappy, ambitious people with beautiful visions who can bring them. You've got such an amazing product, and it took 40 people to crank out those pretty generic. I mean, they were good, but they weren't 40 people working for a year good. But you know what they should do? Um, and maybe they're doing this now, and you've probably heard this, is they should just work on their messaging and just instead of it – calling it advertising, that you just call it education and basically put out educational ads or infotainment ads that talk that tell the truth about electric cards and, and lay waste to all the garbage that, that that the rest of the industry is putting out to try to combat it. You know? Yeah. I I think that's a very popular idea among people like us. I don't know why it hasn't materialize beyond that but i hope it does yeah or they maybe well i don't know i guess you know to tell you the truth i think uh elon knows how powerful all the fan bases and all these podcasters like you and me that are basically giving them free advertising just by talking about the show i mean talking about the company but yeah I don't know. Maybe we could get a side job there. I'll do it for one share of Tesla stock an hour. <laughs> no. One share a day. I'll put in a couple hours of work for one share a day. How about that? Does that seem fair? Uh oh. What happened? That was on my side. The internet okay. just went out. I lost yeah, you. What was, was the on... last thing you heard me say? Okay. You said uh, you think that uh, uh, Tesla knows that people like us who are doing all the – and then it cut out. We, we were talking about promotion and uh, that they don't need advertising because they can crowdsource it and that that people – that Elon understands that people like us are, are doing the heavy lifting. Okay. That's just start right there then. And then I said, um, you know, I'd be willing to put in some part-time ad work for Tesla if they'd pay me one share a day. <laughs> that seems fair. <laughs> yes. But unfortunately that's just not how they work. I think uh, the big missing thing is a lot of times Elon is convinced that if something looks easy, that he's done things that look very, very hard and made them look easy. So when he th sees things that look easy, maybe he believes they are easy. So that's why like, he fired the PR department. What do I need PR for? And the answer is you need PR. They, they've got PR in Germany right? And, and in China because he doesn't speak German and he doesn't speak Chinese. Uh, but in, in the U.S. you need it because media outlets have – come to understand that they can say anything and get no official pushback, except on very rare occasions where Elon will just put out the response, that's a lie. It's like, well, right. which part? Yes. What, 
What what is the truth? You know, they're going to keep running with it until they find out what you're talking about. Don't make them read tea leaves because every time they'll read them differently. Right. Um, it would be it would be at least give people like us the information so we can get it out and cite the official sources. I've written up a plan once that would show how you could have a one person PR department that could actually handle it all and in ways that would make it work. You know, you can send in any question you want to the PR line. If we see a question off FAQ and please read that first, because if the, if you ask a question that's already been answered in the last couple of months, buddy, you're going to be wasting our time. Well, but of course, like now study those things. I mean, they have, you know, they have an AI that's running the whole factory now, right? Well, I, I would imagine they do. Um, have you heard about that? They have like, there's, this, I don't, I don't recall. Uh, I saw it on some channel where, um, oh, Joe justice. Uh, maybe they have like this, there's AI that's, uh, aware of all the processes in the factory. And then what you do is you send in up engineering updates to it and it sort of helps orchestrate how all these things are going to now be put into production and it can mm. see it can do it like within you know uh, something like you know you can do a design change and like that afternoon it's already in production something mm. that crazy you know they, they move so much more quickly than other companies yeah it's when they when they had the pr department they would do things like reach out to people who have Tesla channels or would be tweeting about, you know, the, 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 the right people, the people that I would now be in the category of, but right. I didn't have a channel back then. And they would say, look, we're, we're going to be unveiling track mode, come out to California and we'll let you burn up some tires. Cool. Oh my gosh. They got so many great videos out of that. That's not a thing anymore. They don't do that. They don't mm. let anybody in on those kinds of deals anymore. And mm. it's, Ridiculous. It's it's heartbreaking. Last quarter, when they had the Cybertruck delivery event, head of investor relations, Martin Vieca, said, hey, if you've got a plus one and you're not using it, invite someone who you think really deserves to come. I'm inviting James Stevenson. And James Stevenson got to go. And that's great. But you know what, Martin? You're the head of investor relations. This is your job. And uh, by the way, today he uh, announced he will be stepping down. Um. Kimball Musk, if you're watching the show right now, might we suggest that you, when using your brotherly uh, connections, get Elon to do what Brian's saying right now? We do, <laughs> you know, the, we are, we cost nothing. We don't even ask for a shrimp platter. If you're mm -hmm. having an event, just give us tickets. I do just like artichokes, though. Spend our own money. I like right. art artichoke. Okay, so here, one so. artichoke just for Matt, <laughs> and then the rest of us will be fine. Right. But, you know. No it, oysters. The oysters already, are gross. <laughs> the event is already happening. All right. All right. Do you want, like with Cyber Rodeo, there were 20,000 tickets. That was and cool. I didn't, and I didn't get one. I flew all the way there. I held my own meet and greet earlier in the day. I was permitted for a hundred people. I called them at the last minute and said, make it two. And uh, when I showed up two hours before it started to get set up, there were already about 350 people there. Uh, and it, we ended up with about 700, which was my first time putting together an event like that. And it wow. got a little crazy, a little stressful, mm -hmm. but it was amazing. And uh, but I didn't get into the event and there were countless people who didn't know what Tesla was, didn't know what the, didn't know anything, didn't care. They're just there because they got a free ticket. So let's go. And uh, it's, you know, that's a level of oversight that I would not expect from a company 100 times smaller. So it's hmm. weird. Okay. Weird. Well, the, the, then that's an egg we need to crack. We yeah. just have to do. I mean, basically, what Elon does is whenever a problem presents itself to him that convinces him that it's important and requires his attention, he basically goes into sort of a med meditative state, gets down to the quarks, you know, or at least into the new, new atoms, then the nucleus, and 
you know, to the essential laws of physics and the vibrational frequencies and so on. Then he emerges with the solution. So that's all we have to do. We just all, all the YouTubers have to get together and do a group meditation <laughs> until we come up with a solution that will get us the proper PR department. Yeah. <laughs> the, problem, the, the problem is the system as it is already works for 90, 95% of the people doing this. Yeah, um, that's a problem, yeah. And the other 5% are left out in the cold. So we're just uh, whiners. <laughs> oh. I don't think you are, but I definitely am. I definitely am because it's frustrating. I've, you know, I've been removed by security. More oh, than I want to see that video. Oh yeah. It's, it's, I'll find it for you. It'd be okay. look for December of 22 is the, there was a live stream I did. Now, were you, were you properly defenestrated? Uh, they they told me to get out of there, and I said I wouldn't move until security came and made me move, and they did, because it's just such absolute nonsense. <laughs> I don't I don't understand. I don't understand, and uh, it makes it very hard to do my job, and it makes okay. it uh, you know. Do you want me to do my job? Do you want me to? If you want me to go the path of least resistance, I can tell you there's going to be a whole lot of videos about things that are not Tesla coming up, but I have not been doing that. Right. Um, because there's something about Tesla that just resonates in your soul that makes you want yeah. to put up with all this abuse. Well, it's the same thing. We all know that Elon is half crazy, mm -hmm. but we also know he's a genius. And then we just know how to deal with when when he, he gets triggered and becomes an emotional child and starts pouting and firing people or whatever we just all or or lashing out on social media yeah look but if thank I had god to we have with... kimball musk and i don't know who else it is that that can that knows how to handle him and talk him down when he starts flipping out you know <laughs> right well there are people who look at the walter isaacson biography and That's say amazing. look at I've, all these of course read it of course, look yeah. at all these negative things. These are definitely true. Oh, but this positive thing that Kimball is the voice of reason. Well, that part I choose not to believe. Well, either, either Mr. Isaacson is reputable or he isn't. He you is. can't pick. Well, I agree. But if, but if they want to say he's not reputable, you need to throw out all the other stuff that fit your narrative. And, uh, yeah, At they're just cherry consistent. picking. I mean, you know what they're doing. They just cherry pick oh, the yeah. negative because they know that the negativity sells. Right, right. If I had to deal with some of these uh, absolute floppy spatulas on social media, <laughs> I I would lose myself a little bit too. I would, I would get frustrated and impatient in ways that he does as well. Right. So. The problem is he then says, he then tells the world uh, to go frunk your suitcase. Go fuck off. Yeah. yeah. And they. Uh, in no uncertain terms. <laughs> in no uncertain terms. And then turns around and says, why does everybody hate me? <laughs> I think I have a theory. I have a theory. It's just a theory. But. Uh, well, there's a couple of reasons why they hate him. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, there's people that sure. are genuinely threatened by him. And they, they are so afraid that they need to come up with all kinds of dirty tricks. And create a whole campaign with that to try to somehow knock them down because they're so desperate. That's the only thing I can think of. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, and look at the moneyed interests. Which moneyed interests are one of his businesses uh, threatening? You've got all of transportation, all of driving, all of labor, all of automotive, all of the unions. You've got every oil nation. You've got every space nation. I mean, the... People saying that, well, he's buddy-buddy with Putin. No, but Putin would like you to think that because he wants to divide us. He's not, they are not friends. Elon's company, SpaceX, single-handedly dismantled the Russian commercial space launch industry. And guess what? Tesla's coming for their oil exports and natural gas exports next, both through uh, automotive means and through grid-scale energy storage. So Russia does not like Elon Musk. Oh, and then not to mention uh, putting Starlink on the front lines of Ukraine. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, but though that does beg the question, when, 
despite all this, there is the inevitability that at some happy day in the future, there will be a Russian gigafactory. So when do you think that will happen? I don't know if it ever will. Uh, GM and Ford never built plants there, and they were large global players at one time, two of the biggest automotive companies in the world. And I don't know that they had ever built in Russia because Russia is not a very big market. It's a country with less, you know, what, what's the population? It's in the tens of millions. It's not over That's 100. It? Oh, yeah, it's a very small. Let's check it out. Uh, population of Russia. Uh, okay, 144. It is more yeah, than I thought. Market. Yeah, that is more than I thought. But it is down. It is lower than it was in 1990. So they... Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so, but they're very poor and they're not run in a way that's conducive to entrepreneurship, I guess, is a polite way of putting it. That's true. Yeah. Hmm. So you're saying never. I'm saying never. Most of the population of Russia lives in the near the Western border, just ship cars over from Germany or Poland. Okay, how about Giga Ukraine then? <laughs> if there's well, anything left. Just, yeah. Uh, I don't see why. Why would you need to build one that close to Germany? I mean, never say never, but uh, the first objective is to get them spread out around the world in places where they're needed. I think one in Africa would make sense before another one in Northern Europe. Are you talking North Africa or like Central Africa? Uh, definitely not central because that's a whole lot of nothing there. It'd still be coastal. It would be. It wouldn't be one of the landlocked countries. But um, I don't know where. Like Giga Egypt. Uh, Egypt is too unstable. Um, I'm thinking more like you know Nigeria, which is uh, mm. very populous and one of the richer countries. Starling How about Giga Ariabra Ethiopia? Um, I don't know. I haven't studied Ethiopia enough. I don't know anything about it. Okay. Uh, South Africa, I've looked at. I think he could be, it would be an inappropriately large facility for a country with that. I mean, it would be a very substantial chunk of its um, industry, but that doesn't mean you couldn't do it. Okay. And it would, it would absolutely make a difference to the, to the entire economy. Or oh, I just had an idea. I'm ready. Especially with this unbox thing. Now that they're getting so efficient and they need so much less floor space, maybe they won't maybe there'll be an option where they don't have to make gigafactories. They can make little small factories with maybe one line on it that are ultra efficient. Mm. It it's possible. And the unbox method, if you so there's a thing called a knockdown factory, which is where you bring in cars that are mostly finished and then finish them. And that's usually done to skirt import laws. So, for example, Lucid has a factory in Saudi Arabia. Okay. They build the cars in Arizona and ship them. And then the final assembly takes place there. I don't know what they put in. And Maybe then the ship seats. them back to Arizona. Well, it's unclear where those cars go. <laughs> it's a mess. But Saudi Arabia owns the majority of that country, of that company. Okay. So that uh, what what they say, I mean, you really got to make them happy. Uh, well, maybe they, they do that so that then they, then they can upholster the kilos of cocaine into the seats. I don't think that's something Saudi Arabia does, but <laughs> um, but with a knockdown factory on Unboxed, you could literally send the car in, you know, the front, back, and rear when it gets there, bring in domestic windows, bring in domestic wheels and tires, and you got a car. And that's mm. the sort of thing you could set up for pretty cheap pretty much anywhere. And then what you're bringing in is box cars full of components that would store and stow nicely in a, in a shipping container. I've got an even better one. I'm ready. Okay. Get this. What you have is container ships that have all the components. And then what they do is when they come into port, they assemble the car as they're coming into port and they roll them off custom cars from this unbox method. So you've got a ship that can that contains this much space, and then like a clown car, 10,000, 20,000 cars roll out. Exactly. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's hilarious. Well, they, they ship cars right now. They ship finished cars. 
Right. So you just have this a ship. This would be a better use of space. Yeah. The, 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 so you would just be able to snap them all together as they're rolling off the ramp. Yeah. I love it. That's hilarious. And I love it. <laughs> and if you see that on my channel, it's not because I stole it. Definitely. Well, just, but if I, I do mention it, say, I'll give you credit. Yeah. I'll just I'd say Pranakasha Matt. Yeah. Yeah. I patented that. Yeah. Because that's a good one. <laughs> it's, it's so crazy, but I love it. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So what were we talking about? <laughs> well, we, we were talking about where would the factories be? Oh, right. Yeah. So, yeah. Another, so okay. India, of course, makes sense. Okay. Uh, India could also be an export hub for right-hand drive. There's still, uh, what, True. 60, 70 countries that are on right-hand drive. Mind you, it's not 60, 70. It's not a... The percentage of the auto market is only probably 20 to 30%, but that's still millions and millions of cars that need right-hand drive. Uh, though, if if we want to circle all the way back to Tesla's mission, which is to <clears throat> create a sustainable planet Earth, um, in India, uh, the pollution isn't coming so much from cars as it's coming from like little motorbikes and rickshaw things that are powered by two-stroke engines. Those are so. already being replaced so quickly. Oh, really? The, yes. Um, there's a great follow on X, Tesla Owners Club of India. Okay. And he put out numbers recently, within the last probably two, three weeks, showing the adoption rate for two, three, and four-wheel vehicles. And the two-wheel vehicles is the highest e uh, electric adoption rate because you can afford it. <clears throat> it's more than a gas version. But if okay. you're talking $50 versus $80, you can do it. 30 bucks extra, whatever, you know, maybe it's $100 versus 130. You can afford that to make it work and it's quieter, it's smoother, it's better, it's going to last longer. And then the three wheelers are, are in second place. Those are adoption is coming quick of electric rickshaws. Okay. And the four wheelers are just starting to come into the market. So those are the last ones being adopted. So even before uh, B BYD's uh, bid to build a factory has been denied by the Indian government, they don't trust BYD to be sufficiently independent from the country, the government of China, uh, and they don't trust them. So until a big automaker comes in, the air will already start getting better because so many of those old dyno burners are already leaving the road. That's good news. I didn't know. So it's that. encouraging news. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Huh. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, London. Well, I got to stay in London for a few days on yeah. the way out to fully charge in Farnborough, England, last year, and it was the quietest city I've ever been to. The quietest big city I've ever been to, because I've been to New York and Shanghai and Mexico City and all that. Mm -hmm. And the first part of it is they've got their. Uh, you know, they're ultra low emission zone where if you wish, you have to, if you wish to drive into the city center, you have to have an EV or pay like $30 uh, per day in just access fares. As a mm -hmm. result, everyone's driving electric. And the second reason is they're too polite to honk. A city yeah. with almost no honking. Unbelievable. It's very quiet. Of course, in New York City, it's illegal to honk now. That Is they it? passed that law several years ago. Did yeah. it work? Yeah. Huh. I'll be. At least last time I was there, but of course, the last time I was there was ten years ago, so maybe they nullified that law now. But because uh, you know how it used to be, you would just honk. You'd be constantly honking all the time. Yes. You know, just because everybody did, just for the fun of it. <laughs> It, well, uh, the, the honk has a specific meaning, but the problem is it, it means everything. It's like, uh, it's like their version of Aloha. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, so at one point they made it like, a, I don't know, $500 fine to honk, at least on, in, on Manhattan at least. Maybe not all of New York City. But yeah, I remember because a friend of mine let me stay at his apartment in Manhattan and I was like, why is it quiet, so much quieter here? And why is everybody so much friendlier? And they're like, because they made it illegal to honk your car. Wow. <laughs> so, anyhow, I never use my horn. My Even sister when I picked should. me up. 
my sister from Long Island picked me up at my grandma's house in Queens. And we drove out to, I don't know, somewhere an hour, two hours away. And a good 45 minutes into it, I said, huh, your blinker does work. <laughs> She's was, it, was that the first time? Yeah, that was the first time you, well, if you put it on, they'll cut you off. So you just go. <laughs> okay. No, I understand. I understand why you did it. I just thought it was something that you just never did. Okay. I got an India story similar to that. Okay. Uh, if you've ever, I never drove, but I took a taxi cab in India and it's complete chaos. So basically everybody just drives to wherever there's an empty space, no matter where it is. And they just go for it. <laughs> and so after my joke was I'd spent a week there and I've turned to the driver and I said, okay, so which side of the road are you supposed to drive on? <laughs> Cause you couldn't tell because they would, they wouldn't, they didn't care. They just went for the empty space, you know? <laughs> so that's my story. Similar that's to funny. your blinker story. <laughs> One that I saw in Mexico, in Puerto Vallarta, uh, I was in a taxi and it was day, I don't know, six. And I said, hey, man, how come um, every taxi I've been in, the speedometer's disconnected? He goes, oh, mine's, mine's broken. I go, no, 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 not yours. All of them. And he goes, is it really all? I go, yeah. He goes, huh, that's, that doesn't surprise. They do it to keep the miles off the odometer. Right. I was going to say the odometer. Yeah, of course. But- he couldn't believe that not only does he and all of his buddies, but literally every taxi at the time had their, their odometer disconnected. Yeah, the cable got snipped. I don't know what happened. It just broke. You know, after, uh -huh. after you have... For all... After you have two... You know, it's like after you have two or three kids, you got to get snipped. Same thing. After you have two or three customers, you got to snip the odometer cable. <laughs> you got to... You just... It's just... It's just smart practice is what it is. I... And all I could think is, who on earth is going to buy your taxi and not understand that the mileage is very high? It's beaten to like heck because this, the, because this is a chaotic place and it's an old car and it's a taxi. So I don't know who you think you're passing this on to. You will drive it to death. Like my 95 Honda. God yeah. rest its soul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It could have gone another 300,000 miles if I had just screwed the distributor cap back on. Or the distributor right. itself. But instead, I sold out and bought a Model 3. And lived happily My, after. <laughs> so I, I was wanting to buy a Tesla for, you know, ever. But I was not in a financial position to do so. And then the prices started just going up and up. And I looked at it. And I was like, boy, at this point, it's just not going to happen. And then I revisited it six months later. And the prices had gone up even more. And uh, then, of course, last year, the prices started coming back down. My, my van was getting on in years, and uh, I made a couple of videos showing my efforts to try and, you know, like I did an overnight test drive and found out that my family doesn't, in fact, fit in the seven-seat configuration, because that third row, you just don't know until you know. Yeah. And, uh, and I was looking at it, and I was showing how the numbers just kind of, they're, they're right on the edge of working. And then uh, one of my regular viewers posted the comment saying, what will you be able to live with yourself if you get in an accident tomorrow and you know that you could have done something different, have been in a different, safer car? Will you be able to forgive yourself? And I was like, no, no, that's, that's it. That is the answer. And I said, you, you know, I didn't even tell you what I drive. It's a 2016 Nissan Quest. If you want to see a horror show, go pull up the small overlap rigid barrier crash tests and you will see that this car was not designed for one of the most common types of impacts it just it's brutal and so that was that was the tipping point well i don't know if you have i went to the tesla website yesterday and the model y is like ten thousand bucks less than the model three right now it depends on which model it is because yeah, you could get well, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can get a, a all-wheel drive model y for like Thirty-four thousand bucks. It when it counts the tax and set him set of and the gas savings. Yeah, but the the Model Three, the new Model Three, was way more. It's more like forty-four for the all-wheel drive. Three, um, the all-wheel drive still 
should have the tax incentive, but the rear wheel drive doesn't because it's using Chinese batteries and those don't qualify. Under the Darn order. those Chinese batteries. It's difficult because it's created a perverse incentive by which the you're giving out huge, huge incentives to American companies that are making very mild hybrids with very small batteries that no one's ever going to plug in. And then essentially punishing battery electric car makers. I heard for, they have oodles of 4680s just rolling around doing nothing. So we could just throw <laughs> those into the into those Model 3s and then we can get our tax incentive. They do they not just have sell a do-it-yourself kit where you swap out the battery pack with, with um, American-made batteries and then you can get your 7000 bucks. <laughs> yeah, it'd be nice. It'd be nice. They're, they're working on a variety of solutions. Well, first they got to get a PR department, then they can work on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Well, if you ask me if it's a choice between we can hire 10 engineers or 10 PR people, I'm going to say engineers. Yeah, that's probably the, the calculus that he goes through. But, you know, Elon, we've read the book, so we do know he does have some uh, emotional issues so maybe that's one of his issues and you can't talk to him about that type of thing right now without him flying into a rage or just suddenly going silent for two hours well i don't know if you caught the earnings call on the 23rd you might have been uh busy at the time it was today's that, uh, the 23rd right but this isn't going out on the 23rd so i'm oh, uh, speaking clever on behalf of of today you see clever Yes, yes. So I don't know if you caught that, but I caught the last half, last bit of it. Despite the earnings headwinds, despite the production and delivery headwinds, they knew the earnings per share was going to be bad. And it was. It was within a lot of estimates. But there was a lot of very hopeful, very exciting stuff that was shared. One of them is that um, they're still hitting record. Uh, profit and deployments of mega packs and in the next in this year they expect to deploy 75 percent more than they did last year right. which is great for you and me and the world that's great and for the growth everybody. story and the growth story but really for the environment for getting gas peaker plants offline for good um and we saw a lot of things like that we saw that uh the plan for Robotaxi is alive. The plan for a revised, easier compact car, which could come literally one year from now, um, is alive. And Wall Street reacted favorably, which is why the stock went up after hours. Speaking of Robotaxis, <clears throat> are you going to buy a Robotaxi when it becomes available? I'm like the moment, the second it becomes available, I'm going to put down a deposit on as many as I can. <laughs> and he better I'm, allow just normal old people like me to buy them and create our, our little robo taxi fleets. Um, it sounds like from the call today that you can, that they will sell them to anyone and that the car you already have can be dispatched and not just put into a pool where you lose control. You could literally put it in and say, here are the five people who are allowed to summon my car. Uh, oh, you cool. could say, I will. Yeah, friends and family. You could just only friends and family, people I know personally. If you meet oh, me, I'll add you. Oh, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. Wow. You could say, I will really only smart. accept five star rated passengers only. Well, the um, friends and family thing is really smart. Wow. Yeah. Because so you if just you just have live, it go pick up your yeah. kids. Yeah. Or whatever. And they don't have to bug you. They can literally, uh, your kids go out. With their friends, all of a sudden, someone's been drinking and they don't feel safe getting in the car with them. They don't even have to call you. They just pull up the app and it says eight minutes. That's brilliant. I did not even think of that. Yeah. That it could be personalized like that. Duh. Yeah. So now, you know, you've seen families where they'll all live together and pool resources, maybe share a car. Now, sharing a car would be convenient because you don't even have to live together to share the same car. Huh. And you know, they have all these software engineers, they could probably make a really good app. <laughs> that's probably what they're doing right software. now. They probably already have it. 
Hmm. Well, they showed a glimpse of it on uh, page 22 of the investor slideshow today. The investor oh, cool. of the earnings report. So you can see a little bit of what it actually even looks like. <sighs> I know. That's for a not exciting. very exciting quarter. Wow. The earnings call was remarkably hopeful. Okay. Yeah. Uh oh. My communicator. <laughs> you know that? You know I that? can. Yeah. Sorry. I can't I can't take that right now. I'm on a show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like I said, we've already blown through ninety minutes, and it seems like we're just getting yeah, yeah. started. So, <laughs> um, is there any? We di did we hit all the topics that you wanted to talk about? Because this is your chance to talk about stuff that you don't get to talk about on other channels. Well, um, you know, uh, uh, my topics are covered. The thing I would say is, if you uh, have an EV. Uh, consider taking someone out for a drive who you know and love who hasn't had the experience yet because any brand you get any ev is going to be safer in a crash than any internal combustion car the, and it's not going to stink up built, the planet and it, and it's not going to stink up the planet they're more fun to drive and they're safer that's a winning combination you owe it to your friends and family if you uh don't have one of these cars consider looking at EV clubs to see when they have their ride and drive events, all that. I participate in, I'm a member of like four different clubs uh, because I want to support them and I want to help their clubs out. And uh, so I do a lot of guest speaking that way. And it's just a, a, a bunch of fun. Okay. Well, before we wrap up, I do want to ask you one oh, here um, we go burning question that everybody wants to ask but they're afraid to uh oh is I it the lemon this? tree <laughs> well i do i love that tree that that's an orange tree or lemon tree it's a lemon tree it's plastic yeah okay but did you notice that your backdrop has a slight wrinkle in the corner there oh yeah 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 i i oh. i've i've noticed <laughs> I'm, i was wondering about that i straighten it out at different times and it just uh you know, the, the, there will be an, uh, a backdrop revision coming within the next probably less than a month because we're doing some redecorating inside and I'll have some okay. access to, to more interesting stuff. Well, I'll tell you what I can do. I can buy these little clamps on eBay and I could have them shipped to you. You could just mm -hmm. put a clamp or two on the bottom to sort of stretch it out a bit. It, it unfortunately doesn't work that way because it's also attached to the rafters, which are spaced differently than this obstacle over here. So... Oh, so the whole house isn't square? Is that the problem? Uh, it's settled. I am. I. You know what? I'll give you a sneak peek here. Okay. I am in a carriage house. Okay, so I don't know what a carriage house is. It's like a garage that you can't really park a car in because uh, they had to do so much work to keep it from falling down because it wasn't built with codes. That. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a big dumb space is what it is. It was built without permits, I am sure. The only thing holding it up is tradition, but it's a strong tradition. And Okay, uh, how about this? Like one or two bungee cords or a couple of rubber bands just on that down, corner down in the bottom and you just stretch it a bit. Really bugs, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, that's so much better already. Is it? Or we could just hire somebody to pull on that and just stay there out of out of view of the camera. Or a it potted a plant. Actually, another potted plant that covers that up would also work to keep the lemon tree uh, company. It, it shouldn't matter for much longer. The backdrop will be changed within a matter of weeks, I am, I am confident. Okay. I'll just hold my breath. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Um, anything else? I don't think so. I think, I think we got it all covered. Yeah, we got uh, me. Yeah. I want to encourage you to do more comedy, though, because you do have, see, you have this really, you have this glow that makes people happy when they see you and they hear you talk. And, so, and that would work great for your stand-up routine, you Ooh. know, or whatever Ooh. it is. You, you wouldn't, wouldn't even have to be comedy. You just come up to Mike and just start telling stories. And yeah. that's when I did my seven minute routine, it, what I started by saying is I, I don't tell jokes. I tell stories, true stories, very true, as you'll see. 
And then, of course, you go into the jokes. But it is a story because it's more about the journey than the destination. And right. the way I would write comedy when I was writing comedy was mm -hmm. that every line in a script had to either be a setup or a punchline, every single line. And what was preferred was punchline to punchline to punchline. And the way that works is not every joke is going to land. And especially if there's no laugh track, people don't necessarily know where to laugh. If I can hit even one in 10 jokes, if I'm getting 10 jokes out in a minute, that four minute video is still going to have four big laughs. And most people will get two or three a minute. Right. And some people will get new jokes every time they watch. And Plus, uh, that's if my. You, if you can't objective. afford a laugh track, you can just use one of these. Ah, <laughs> you know, I keep my, my car lock tone on random and that is one of them. <laughs> uh, okay. Sound effects. Or if you want to soothe people, there's this. I will not. That will put I'm them not asleep. here. I'm not here to soothe people. But also, I'm going to throw another thing. Also, your voice sounds really cool. Like your voice you. has a certain Kermit the Frog kind of quality to it. <laughs> and when you hear it, it just makes you it makes you feel happy when you hear it. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't. So know those are two things my... right off the bat that with that. Oh yeah. <laughs> this this was for my April Fool's joke. Yeah, I know. Um, but it uh, was for April Fool's. It was not me doing the show. It was uh, it was Jack. Wow. Yeah. So there you go. There you go. The whole I was raised day. on Muppets. Okay. Here's a, here's a here's some dish for you. Okay, here's dish. an exclusive. All right. My God. Finally. You're not going to be you're not going to be ready for this. Who was the first impression I ever did? And I'll help you out. I was maybe nine or ten and it was a good impression i'm gonna say yoda no nope nope no it, uh, but uh, you're close in in the world it was someone who appeared on the muppet show okay uh just a sec gonzo it wasn't a muppet oh but they were on the show now that one well, that's fozzy bear but um Wait, wait, wait. It's not a Muppet, but it's a well-known personality. Uh, a well-known, yes. You will recognize the name for sure. It was a, the guest of the week. Um, one tiny hint. Uh, singer. Lounge singer. Ooh. Um, lounge singer, okay. Um. Well, I'm Barry Manilow. <laughs> so you're going to love this. Imagine a nine-year-old kid doing a Carol Channing impression. Diamonds <laughs> are a girl's best friend. Yes, yes, they are. All right. We got what that. What the hell? Carol Channing? That's your first. Okay. Okay. By the way, that, that impression, not useful in life. Well, you just need to find the proper context for it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there you go, my comedy roots. All right. There we go. All right. And then um, you do watch Star Trek, though, right? Because you recognize um, certain things. Yeah, some of them. Some of them more than others. Okay. Well, then we'll do our traditional thing, which is I always have my guests do this. Everybody's been of able course, to do it. Of course. And we just say live long and prosper. Live long and, and may we run into each other on the train to and from Portland at some point, maybe? Are you are you in the Seattle area uh, that often? I don't take the train. Um, less than I used to be, but I might be up in Linwood, actually. My brother has a place there sometimes, so I might be up there in the next maybe few weeks. Uh, hit me up if you want to go out. Like, like go to a bar or whatever. Yeah, I will. Just if, hang out. If I'm in Linwood, I will absolutely okay. let you know. Sounds All right. fun. Yeah. All right, sir. We'll catch you on the internet tomorrow. Oh, we forgot that. Okay, links. So your channel, once again, is oh, yeah. called... Uh, Future Raza. Future, Future, Future Raza. Mm -hmm. It's on YouTube. I'm on X as at Future Raza. It's just where I'm at. Right. And this is the legendary Brian White, Tesla guru. And rising star on his way to 100,000 subscribers.
than a million, five million, hundred million. The sky's the limit. Mm -hmm. All right, sir. Till next time. Till next time. Take care. Fantastic creations emerging spontaneously from the space of life. For the benefit of all beings everywhere. We got it.